So can I uh, invite um, Chris to come forward for our afternoon exposition. Good afternoon, Chris. Good afternoon. How, How are, are you? Everyone? I'm very well, thank you. How are you? I think I'm still surviving. Good. <laughs> it's been a long day, isn't it? Yeah, it's a long day. It's a long day. Yes, uh, Chris, your first trip to Malaysia? My first trip to Malaysia. Yeah. I'm, I'm loving it very much indeed. Yeah. Why not? Why not? Uh, tell us about yourself, your family, uh, your current ministry. So I'm the uh, minister, it's an Anglican church, I'm the vicar of a church in the north of London. I've been there for about two years. Uh, before that, for about 12 years, I was teaching in a seminary, uh, again in the north of London. And before that, I was working in various churches as well. So, um, yeah, I'm a pastor who's taught in seminary. I'm not an academic, I don't have a doctorate or anything. I was teaching some of the practical sides of, uh, of ministry skills. Uh, married to Sharon, we've been married about 23 years. We've got two teenage boys, one of whom, the eldest one, is with me. Well, not with me at this second. He's, I think, geeking out on a computer screen somewhere with some friends he's made. But he's uh, having a really good time. Uh, the youngest one is at home enjoying the fact that he hasn't got his eldest brother around. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Um, Chris, can you, um, today our focus is on Old Testament, mm. especially how not to still handle uh, God's word as letter that kills. Um, in, your ex in your years of teaching in seminary at the local church, and also previously training preachers with Cornhill, um, what are some areas that you've encountered where students, uh, members, even preachers struggle in terms of how they handle the Old Testament? I think there are two, and they happen one after the other. And if, if I might be so bold, I think you're heading towards the second one. In that the first problem is the Old Testament is a big and complex book. Mm. And you simply don't understand how it all works. And then comes along biblical theology. Now, mm. when I was training for ministry, we'd honestly never heard of it. I was... In my second post leading a church before it dawned on me that the exile might be as, as, as important as the exodus, um, we simply hadn't got the tools. There are now wonderful tools for you to put the Bible together, the Old Testament together. Mm. Graham Goldsworthy, but other things as well. Mm. Um, the first problem is how to make sense of the Old Testament. The second problem comes when you've got a really good model in your head. Mm. And I quite like saying God's people in God's place under God's promise. That's a really simple little way of describing the Old Testament plot line at any point. Mm. The problem comes when you've got that which is simple and clear, but your passage is complicated. And what you then do is you helicopter out of the passage into your biblical theology. Which then means, and this is the second problem, all your Old Testament sermons become the same. Because wherever you start from, you get to God's people in God's place under God's promise, let's make an ark to Jesus. And you lose the flavor, the particularity, the literary shape of, of the Old Testament passages. So the first problem is you don't know how it all fits together. The second is you have a really simple way of it all fitting together and every Old Testament passage feels the same. So that's the second problem I see. And I'd encourage you to face up to that and press through that one to the point where you begin to work again with different literary stories where you can handle a narrative without reducing it to a three points beginning with P talk. Mm -hmm. That's a very helpful reminder. I think. Uh uh, Peter, in his lecture earlier on, reminded us also don't allow our approach to the Bible become monotonous. Mm. Uh, I think this is a very helpful yep. reminder as well to uh, let the text, I guess, uh, uh, yes. determine how we handle the text. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Chris. Um, is there something practical we can suggest, something that perhaps you are doing at your church, uh, for your church members, for your leaders, how to help them to grasp the Bible in such a way that do not fall into either one of those 
or keep them away, keep reminding them against either one of those uh, dangers? I, I think in our church, and I guess in most churches too, it's actually the first one that is the problem. They simply don't know how the Bible fits together. So we run, I guess, what everybody else does, a simple biblical theology, Bible theology overview. Um, full of promise is a good simple one. It's about nine little Bible studies. Uh, Andrew's postcards from Palestine, something which will help people get the plot and the flow of how the Old Testament fits together and points to Jesus. And doing that over a term with a bunch of people, just regularly, feeds the information in. Uh, I find it helpful to remind people whenever we can. So we've just finished uh, a series on Exodus. And we just kept putting up God's people in God's place under God's promise on the screens over a picture of a pyramid, because it's a three little di so a real Egyptian pyramid. We use, we use the thing. Um, so we just keep reminding it at the basic level. And then every so often, we try to do something which gives the whole issue some leverage. So, again, we're Anglicans, so we take something like Lent seriously. Lent is the 40 days before Easter. So two years ago, uh, as a church, we read through the entire New Testament together. We had uh, daily readings worked out for us all, bookmarks. We gave people dedicated New Testaments, so we all read the same thing. Um, there were children's resources, family study guides, the sermons all fed in together. Um, this last year, we did it with the narrative section of the Old Testament. So we did it from the beginning of Genesis through to the end of uh, Two Kings, I think. And again, everything was lined up, the small groups, our personal reading, the family reading. Um, and it was a, an intentional focus for the church to help us get there. Because whilst it may be a problem for people at seminary, that they, they know the biblical theology too well and everything becomes the same. For most people in churches, it will always be the case that they can't make sense of the whole. So we just, we never graduate beyond that really basic level of teaching of how the whole thing comes together. Mm. Mm. Um, Chris, can you just ask for uh, a little bit more on the, how does the pulpit plan fits in with the, like the full of promise studies. Uh, how, how do they fit in together? How do you plan them? Oh, no, we don't tie it in with full of promise because full of promise just keeps coming round every so often. Um, we have various little courses and groups that run from time to time and that's just one of them and people know and it's, it's like a bus. If you miss one, there's another one coming along. You can always do that. But um, with the... Uh, it's no accident that we've just finished a series on Genesis, oh, on Exodus, because we were deliberately tying the Exodus series in so that it tied in with the, the readings at home. The children's groups, are, our children's group run most Sundays, but all the children's groups from the tinies through to the teens, we were doing Exodus together week by week. Um, when once a month we all came together for our all-age services, again, we tied the whole thing together with Exodus. So, we just planned that little bit more carefully to coordinate everything. We don't do that all year round, so for most of the year, the morning services, the evening services are doing different things. Um, the small groups, the Bible study groups, might be coordinating with the morning or the evening or doing something different, give a balanced diet. Children's groups might be doing something different. But for that one season of the year, we just align everything with a focus and a purpose. Thank you, thank you very much. That, that has helped me to uh, um, stress that uh, it's not about doing more in the church, but rather how to incorporate all this mm. to existing things that we are doing. Yeah, yeah. We're, we're spotting that people are really are busy. Mm. And so rather than putting one more thing in, mm. if we can line what they're already doing mm. together, that helps them. Thank you, thank you. If you have uh, anything more you want to uh, talk to Chris about, about these things, yeah, yeah feel free. Yeah? Uh, I think uh, there's a lot we can learn from what is happening in churches like his. Thank you, Chris. I yeah, look forward to hearing God's word from you. Thank you. Thank you, Kehan. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Would you like to take your Bibles and turn to Jeremiah chapter 11? We're going to look at the first, the first 13 verses of Jeremiah 11. And let's pray before we do.
Heavenly Father, would you please open your word to our hearts and please would you open our hearts to your word. Amen. Amen. Jeremiah 11, verse 1. This is the word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord. Listen to the terms of this covenant and tell them to the people of Judah and to those who live in Jerusalem. Tell them that this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. Cursed is the man who does not obey the terms of this covenant, the terms I commanded your ancestors when I brought them out of Egypt, out of the iron smelting furnace. I said, Obey me and do everything I command you, and you will be my people and I will be your God. Then I will fulfill the oath I swore to your ancestors to give them a land flowing with milk and honey, the land you possess today. I answered, Amen, Lord. The Lord said to me, Proclaim all these words in the towns of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem. Listen to the terms of this covenant and follow them. From the time I brought your ancestors up from Egypt until today, I warned them again and again, saying, Obey me. But they did not listen or pay attention. Instead, they followed the stubbornness of their evil hearts. So I brought on them all the curses of the covenant I had commanded them to follow, but they did not keep. Then the Lord said to me, There is a conspiracy among the people of Judah and those who live in Jerusalem. They have returned to the sins of their ancestors who refused to listen to my words. They have followed other gods to serve them. Both the house of Israel and the house of Judah have broken the covenant I made with their ancestors. Therefore, this is what the Lord says. I will bring on them a disaster they cannot escape. Although they cry out to me, I will not listen to them. The towns of Judah and the people of Jerusalem will go and cry out to the gods to whom they burn incense, but they will not help them at all when disaster strikes. You have as many gods as you have towns, O Judah, and the altars you have set up to burn incense to that shameful god Baal are as many as the streets of Jerusalem. Do not pray for this people, nor offer any plea or petition for them, because I will not listen when they call to me in the time of their distress. Travelling internationally always makes you see things a little bit differently. Whenever I settle into my seat on a plane, I always think this is a little bit like getting very old. You sit in a chair and they give you a blanket and a pillow. A nice lady comes around with meals to make sure that... Uh, and you can call her on a bell if you, if you need it. They switch on the television for you and you can watch programs. And after a while you realize that you're falling asleep halfway through every film that they put on up there. After a while you begin to ask questions like, what time is it? And where am I? <laughs> and you begin to find it easier to fall asleep in the daytime and stay awake at night. It's a strange thing, traveling on a plane, a long journey. Wouldn't it be awful if we treated God like that? If we treated him like a, a convenient way to get from one destination to another, from sin to salvation, and all we had to do was sit back, lie back, and wait for him to serve us. My friends, my pastor friends, don't we know that there are folk in our church like that? Or take my son, my teenage son, who's with me. Um, I have left him uh, during the day with a pocket full of money and instructions to feed himself. It's part of the whole growing up process. In other cultures, they send them out against lions. Here, I've sent him up against a supermarket. Uh, he has to go downstairs, find a, find a convenient store. He has to go inside, find some food, and return to his room. He has to forage in the wild. <laughs> Now, of course, he doesn't actually have to engage with Malaysian culture at all, does he? He discovered that one of the words that translates seamlessly from English into Malaysian is the word Pringle. And so he goes downstairs and he finds his tube of Pringles and a sandwich without speaking to anybody, hands over the note, gets back some change and retreats to his room. 
Wouldn't it be awful if we treated God like a convenience store? He provides for us, we don't engage with him. He meets our needs, but we treat him like someone we can't communicate with at all. Wouldn't it be awful if we treated God like that? My friends, my pastor friends, there are folk in our church like that, aren't there? My friends, my pastor friends, we're like that, aren't we? Have you never known that dreadful Sunday when you stand up to pray before you preach the sermon and you realize that's actually the first time you've prayed about that sermon? Let's look at Jeremiah. Jeremiah has some hard words, but also some blessings, but some hard words for us to take on board. Um, if you think about a, a ball sport like tennis or golf, you'll know that there's a moment of impact with the ball. And what really makes the ball work properly is not that the racket or the club hits the ball, but the backswing. The backswing that comes before the impact determines the direction and the force of the ball. And here in Jeremiah 11, we have got the contact point between the golf club and the ball, or the tennis racket and the ball. But Jeremiah also shows us the backswing. What's happened before to explain that moment of impact and say what's going to happen. We heard yesterday from Andrew that uh, Jeremiah spoke during the reign of five kings. Josiah, good king, dies unnecessarily in battle. Jehoahaz, you won't hear much about him, he was only a king for three months and he was a puppet king anyway. Jehoiakim, bad king. Jehoiakim, won't hear much about him, only a king for three months and he was a puppet king anyway. And then Zedekiah, the last and the worst of the lot. And then, he, then there's final defeat and exile. If you want, want to remember that Zedekiah was the last king, what's the last letter of the English alphabet? Z. Okay? <laughs> Zedekiah. It's, it. Sorry, we're going to be teaching at this level. We've, we've, you've, you've had Don, now you've got me. Um, <laughs> that's the background to Jeremiah, those five kings. And behind them is international politics. The big empire of Assyria, which has been dominant for centuries, is imploding. Egypt, which fears the power vacuum, is trying to move up and take over, but fail. And the one that really does go in and do a power grab is Babylon. Big international politics happening in the background to Jeremiah. The first king, Josiah, the one who I said died unnecessarily, died because he moved into those battles. And he lost. And the rest of Jeremiah, once Josiah dies, plays out against the looming threat from Babylon and the temptation of apparent safety in Egypt. And of course, that is not the greatest reality of all. The greatest reality is that this apparent threat from Babylon, which ended up with the armies camping outside the city, this threat from Babylon was actually God's plan, was actually God's judgment. He intended it to occur. Which means that obedient people walk into that judgment. That was Jeremiah's message. If you obey God, you will walk into exile in Babylon. You will open the gates of the city, you will walk outside, embrace the army of your enemies and be carried off into captivity. That is the obedient thing to do. Disobedient people resist or run away. Obedient people go into exile. Now that's the heart of Jeremiah's dilemma, because of course that sounds like cowardice, doesn't it? That sounds like treason. That sounds like the worst possible advice you could give anybody. And for Jeremiah, that's the dilemma. Obedience looks like treason. But Jeremiah knows, and we saw this yesterday from Jeremiah 1, that judgment is not God's final word. 
When you walk into judgment, you may walk out the other side into hope and victory. And the key to the problem is not international politics, it's not regime change. The key is to accept God's judgment. And that was hard because they'd resisted it. You see, behind Jeremiah, not just five kings, and this is the backswing going right back, behind Jeremiah are hundreds of years of deliberate disobedience and hundreds of years of warnings. Look with me at verse 7 of Jeremiah 11. From the time I brought your ancestors up from Egypt until today, I warned them again and again, saying, Obey me. But they did not listen or pay attention. Instead, they followed the stubbornness of their evil hearts. Hundreds of years of disobedience, hundreds of years of warnings. And that reference to Egypt there, you see it? From the time I brought them up from Egypt, that reference to Egypt is critical. Because it was after the rescue from Egypt that God made a covenant with his rescued people. And that's where it all began. That is the top of the backswing, if you like. Look again with me at verse 3. Tell them this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. Cursed is the man who does not obey the terms of this covenant. The terms I commanded your forefathers, your ancestors, when I brought them out of Egypt, out of the iron smelting surface. That's the top of the backswing. That's when God laid out his covenant, especially in the book of Deuteronomy, laid out the covenant with blessings and curses. Can you spot, or did you spot all the way through our passage, the reference to covenant? Verse 2, covenant. Verse 3, covenant. Verse 6, covenant. Verse 8, covenant. Verse 10, covenant. This passage is charged with references to Deuteronomy. And it's not unique to chapter 11. Someone said that Jeremiah is an extended commentary on Deuteronomy. But there's a focus here in chapter 11 on that particular biblical book. You don't need to do the work now. I'm sure you can see it from your cross-references. There's references here to Deuteronomy 4, Deuteronomy 6, Deuteronomy 8, Deuteronomy 11, 13, 26, 27, 28, 31. It's a great big hint from Jeremiah. Please go back to Deuteronomy. So, let's take the hint, shall we? Keep a finger in Jeremiah 11 and turn back with me to the book of Deuteronomy. Fifth book of the Bible. If you can't find it, remember, use the index. That's the rule. Je Deuteronomy chapter 7. We're not going to read it, but just cast your eyes over it. Over it. Chapter 7 gives a whole list of blessings. And in Jeremiah 11, if you paid attention, they are all unwound. Verses 13 and 14 of Deuteronomy 7 talk about fruitfulness. Well, Jeremiah's land knows starvation. 22 to 24 talks about military victory. Well, Jeremiah 11 now knows defeat, the possibility of humiliation, the certainty of exile. 25 and 26 talks about the purity of worship. It's a great blessing. Jeremiah 11 shows that they have been trying any other good God they could find in chance of some kind of hope. So Deuteronomy 7 stands there as the great set of promises, and in Jeremiah 11 they turn to ash. And in fact, it's even clearer if you turn to 27 and 28. So turn with me to Deuteronomy 27, 28, and that's the big part of Deuteronomy we're going to look at. These are like a coiled spring. They're laying out Israel's future. The first half of chapter 28 lays out the blessings for obedience. If you can't read the passage, just look at the heading over your Bible. First half of chapter 28 lays out the blessings for obedience. Basically, their fruitfulness and prosperity. They will be what will happen to Israel if they obey God. And the second half, 
Well, they're the curses. They will be what will happen to Israel if they disobey God. There's disease, defeat, captivity, exile, impoverishment, humiliation, disgrace. Look with me at verse 45 of chapter 28. All these curses will come upon you. They will pursue you and overtake you until you are destroyed because you did not obey the Lord your God and observe the commands and decrees he gave you. They will be a sign and a wonder to you and your descendants forever. Because you did not serve the Lord your God joyfully and gladly in the time of prosperity, therefore in hunger and thirst, in nakedness and dire poverty, you will serve the enemies the Lord sends against you. He will put an iron yoke on your neck until he has destroyed you. The Lord will bring a nation against you from far away, from the ends of the earth, like an eagle swooping down, a nation whose language you will not understand, a fierce-looking nation, without respect for the old or pity for the young. They will devour, and so on and on it goes. That is what the Jerusalem of Jeremiah's day actually faced. That warning was clicking into place. Under those five final kings, as Babylon moved to burn Jerusalem to the ground. And of course the tragedy was, it was all so predictable. The tragedy was, that was what they'd signed up for with the covenant blessings and curses quite willingly. I mean, look at Deuteronomy 27. In fact, I'll get you to wake up so you can take part in this. It was a magnificent scene. Moses gets the people together. The blessings are written down. The curses are written down. Two great stones. Eventually, they're painted on a, on a mountain. But they're all there in front of them. And Moses gets them to sign up. And this is not an I agree to the terms and conditions click. They actually had to read these and agree. And the agreement is stitched all the way through. So I'll read them as if I'm Moses. And you will see um, from uh, verse 14, you will join in with the people's response. Okay? The Levites will recite to all the people of Israel in a loud voice, Cursed is the man who carves an image or casts an idol, a thing detestable to the Lord, the work of a craftsman's hand, and sets it up in secret. Then all the people shall say, Amen. Cursed is the man who dishonors his father or his mother, and then all the people shall say, Cursed is the man who moves his neighbor's boundary stone, and all the people shall say, Amen. Cursed is the man who leads the blind astray on the road, and all the people shall say, Amen. Cursed is the man who withholds justice from the alien, the fatherless, or the widow, and all the people shall say, Amen. Cursed is the man who sleeps with his father's wife, for he dishonors his father's bed, and all the people shall say, Amen. Cursed is the man who gives his western guest curried stingray and sloppy noodles, and only gives him chopsticks to eat with. <laughs> Sorry, it's a <laughs> personal moment, but it comes from a deep place. <laughs> you can see they deeply agree. They say from the outset, we agree exactly with what God has said here. Now remember those, we're going to come back to them. There'll be a little quiz in a few moments' time. But turn back to Jeremiah 11. If you kept your finger there, turn back to Jeremiah 11. And you will see that what God does here to Jeremiah is summarize just what you've heard. Verse 3. Tell them this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. Cursed is the man who does not obey the terms of the covenant. That is, he summarizes everything from Deuteronomy 27. The terms I commanded your ancestors when I brought them out of Egypt, out of the iron smelting surface. I said, obey me and do everything I command you. You'll be my people and I'll be your God. Then I will fulfill the oath I swore to your forefathers to give them a land flowing with milk and honey, the land you possess today. And Jeremiah answered, Amen. You see what happens? God lays out the covenant in summary form just as he had done in Deuteronomy 28. And Jeremiah, on behalf of the people, says, Amen. Yes, this is what, this is what we signed up for. This is what we said we would do. And then God announces that because the people had not obeyed, now it is time for the curses to kick in. Verse 6. Proclaim all these words in the towns of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem. Listen to the terms of this covenant and follow them. 
From the time I brought your ancestors up from Egypt until today, I warned them again and again, say, saying, obey me. See how it goes? He's saying, now is the time for the curses. That's heavy stuff, isn't it? Heavy stuff. Let, let me try and cheer you up a little bit. Jeremiah is not a gloomy book. I, there's lots of gloomy stuff in it, but ultimately it's profoundly happy. And we saw that last night. Flip back to chapter 1. Let's remind ourselves, when, whenever you get lost in the, some of the gloomier parts of Jeremiah, remind yourself of his call. Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 10. See, today I appoint you over nations and kingdoms to uproot and tear down, to destroy and overthrow, to build and to plant. You see, at the end of the story, there is a happy ending. Beyond judgment, there is hope. Beyond judgment, there is good news. And it's really important we keep this, this in mind. Remember what I said about Jeremiah's message? The safe place to go to when God is your judge, the safe place to go is to run towards him, into judgment and exile. Obedient people walked towards that punishment. Because that was for rebels who accepted that ultimately there'd be forgiveness and restoration. But they have to accept God's judgment on their sin first and not treat their sin lightly. Now, if you think about it, that's a, that's a gospel heart, isn't it? The gospel heart is... We are broken by the gospel. And the longer you're a Christian, the more you realize what the gospel does to you first is break you and drive you to the Lord Jesus Christ. We have just, as we finished our series on Exodus, we've been looking at uh, the Ten Commandments. And with each one, we've been aware of the danger of giving people a little checklist. Do not lie. Fine. Tick. Do not commit murder. Easy. But actually they serve to show us just how lost we are and to drive us to the Lord Jesus Christ. I have first to realize how right God is to judge me before I can receive his grace and his mercy. There's a man in one of the churches where I worked who um, thought I was soft on judgment. Uh, maybe I am, but he had this particular bee in his bonnet. And he used to come up to me. Uh, and say, push it all the way. Go on, push the red button. Push the red button, button on judgment. Push it all the way to judgment. And I ended up by saying to him, I will push it all the way, but you do realize that pushing judgment all the way with a gospel shape will lead to forgiveness and mercy, don't you? Push judgment all the way so that people can see the cross and the resurrection. That's what the people who go into exile have to realize. Right, enough cheerfulness. <laughs> Let's go back to Jeremiah 11. There is one sin, and one sin above all others, which has triggered judgment. Now, let's see how good your memory is. When you agreed to those terms and conditions a few moments ago, what was the first thing you agreed to? What was the first thing you said amen to? What was the first activity which was cursed by God? Do you remember? Idolatry, absolutely. That was the number one thing. We said that, and we said amen to it. And of course, that is not just the first one there. It's summed up in the first two commandments, isn't it? God only, no idols, right at the heart of what they signed up to. Well, now look with me at verse 9. The Lord said to me, There is a conspiracy among the people of Judah and those who live in Jerusalem. They have returned to the sins of their ancestors who refused to listen to my words. They have followed other gods to serve them. Both the house of Israel and the house of Judah have broken the covenant I made with their forefathers. Therefore, this is what the Lord says, I will bring on them a disaster they cannot escape. See what the issue is? Idolatry. And then there is a quite terrifying irony. Verse 12. The towns of Judah and the people of Jerusalem will go and cry out to the gods to whom they burn incense, but they will not help them at all when disaster strikes. 
You have as many gods as you have towns, O Judah, and the altars you have set up to burn incense to this shameful god Baal are as many as the streets of Jerusalem. Do not pray for this people, nor offer any plea or petition for them, because I will not listen when they call to me in the time of their distress. See how it works? You can pray to those gods, but they cannot answer you. And you can come and pray to me, but I will not answer them. See what happens as the curse for their, ju- for their sin kicks in, as the judgment works? The time has come, says God through Jeremiah, for the centuries of idolatry to re- reach their end. Judgment has arrived. Centuries of warnings have been ignored. The armies of Babylon are outside the walls. Those covenant blessings are now officially revoked. The covenant curses are now officially invoked. And by the end of Jeremiah, Jerusalem has been sacked. The treasures from the palace, the temple, have been carted off to glorify Babylon. And for 70 years, the land sits quiet. And we sit here in 21st century Kuala Lumpur, and later on this week I will fly back to the UK. What does a passage like this say to us? Well, let me state the obvious, first of all. God has not made a covenant with your country or with mine. I cannot speak for Malaysia. My country is idolatrous corrupt, violent, and vain. But I cannot call down the covenant blessings and curses on them because they don't stand in the same kind of relation to God that Israel did. I can't announce exile and return to Great Britain, nor can you do it here in Malaysia. I can see London in here, by the way, and Kuala Lumpur, and Sydney, I can see them, they're called Babylon, but that's a story for a different sermon. So how do we read Jeremiah 11 as Christians? Well, and this is going back to what we were looking at this morning with the different kinds of biblical theology. Let me make it simpler because it's the close of the day. Okay? Imagine one of your brilliant main roads, your brilliant highways, motorways running through uh, Malaysia with three lanes. And like all good Malaysian drivers, they are obeying the lane markings Perfectly. (laughs) I haven't been here long, but I've been here long enough. Don't worry. (laughs) Let's give little names to those lanes. Let's imagine three of them. Here's the first one. We'll call that the Royal Lane. And the Royal Lane is the lane that runs clearly, plainly, obviously, straight to the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, there are lots of passages in the Old Testament Psalm 22, you might think of Isaiah 53, where the royal lane is perfectly obvious. You can walk right the way through to Jesus from that. There are a couple of promises within Jeremiah, a promise of a coming son of David who will rule, which work that way. But Jeremiah 11 doesn't do that. You have to stand back a little bit and do the thing I warned you about, about stepping into the biblical theology picture and saying, how does it all fit together? So um, here's another way of describing it. Genesis 1 to 3, creation, God makes his people, calls his people, places them into a beautiful land, gives them a command, they rebel, and they get kicked out of the garden. Genesis 1 to 3, that's the fall, creation and fall. Genesis 4 to the end of Malachi is like that story all over again. It's like the fall in slow motion as God creates and calls his people, places them in a land flowing with milk and honey, gives them beforehand the possibility of blessing and the possibility of cursing. They disobey painfully, slowly, over hundreds of years. You see them heading towards disaster. And eventually they get kicked out of the land at the end of Two Chronicles. It's like the fall in slow motion. How it all fits together. Now, 
That takes us eventually to the Lord Jesus, doesn't it? Because it sets up the problem to which he is the answer. But we have to get out of Jeremiah 11 into Jeremiah as a whole and then into the whole Bible story to get there. So um, I'm not going to take that lane because it would end up sounding like every other Old Testament sermon. Second line through is, uh, we'll call that, this lane contrast, and that's when there is a significant difference between the Old Testament and the New, when there is a very sharp contrast between the two. And here, famously, it is within Jeremiah, isn't it? Between the covenant broken and the new covenant in Jeremiah 31. That is the obvious, easy solution, which is why they've given it to Don tomorrow. <laughs> I can't take that easy route through. So we're going to take a slightly different one. This is the third lane. And, the third, and these are all valid, by the way. You can do all of these. That's the wonderful thing about biblical theology. If you're a mathematician, or you did maths even at high school, you'll know about prime numbers. And you will know that there are lots of prime numbers. In fact, there's an infinity of prime numbers. So if someone said to you, can you list me all the prime numbers? There's an infinity of right answers. Does that mean every answer is right? Oh no. There are more wrong answers than there are right answers. So there are wrong ways of doing biblical theology. But there are lots of wonderful right ways. So let's today look at this way of continuity and how the two work together and uh, where the heart of Jeremiah 11 is echoed in New Testament times. Yes, for us, Jesus is in the picture now. Yes, because of the new covenant, redemption has been accomplished and applied. We are brought into God's people. Our sin has been paid for and we are being restored. But that means, as we've seen when we've looked at the Sermon on the Mount and the way I handled the Ten Commandments, that means that God's character, or God's expectation of our character, rather, is intensified rather than reduced. So let's look at where the heartbeat is in the same place. Remember I said in Deuteronomy 27, 28, you've got those two descriptions, the blessings and the curses, physically painted up for them to see. That's actually a way the Bible uses quite often to describe turning points in Bible history. It's there in miniature in the garden, isn't it? Do not eat of the fruit. You can have every fruit, but do not eat of that one fruit. Blessings, curse. We've seen it in Deuteronomy. As they cross into, cross across the Jordan into take, to take possession of the land, Joshua, Joshua 24, lays out before them the two options of what they can do and says, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. As you go through the Old Testament story, as you open the book of Psalms, you've got Psalm 1, the way of the, the wicked and the way of the righteous. As you go into the wisdom literature with the, book, with the book of Proverbs, you've got the way of the wise, you've got the way of the foolish. Consistently, as you move into a new part of the story, the same two doors keep opening. And if you go beyond Jeremiah to when they come back into the land and with Haggai and Ezra and Nehemiah and the rebuilding of the, uh, of the people and the, and the story, um, again Nehemiah gets them together. Again he announces the covenant. Again the people say, yes, we will. We agree with the, with the apple terms and conditions. And again, by the end of the book, they failed. And you think, will this never end? To which the answer, of course, is yes, it will, with the death and resurrection of Jesus. But still, as we press through, those two doors still swing open in front of us. We've been looking at Galatians, haven't we? How does Galatians end? With the works of the flesh and with the fruit of the Spirit. Which way are you going to go. I warn you, as I warned you before, says Paul, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. Blessings and curses. There are real blessings. Here's Galatians 6. The one who sows to please his sinful nature, from that nature will reap destruction. 
The one who sows to please the Spirit, from the Spirit will reap eternal life. Hear the same? Blessings and curses. There are still two destinies. Remember, these are warnings given to the Galatian Christians. And ultimately, at the end, there will still be the same two doors. Where Jesus says, come, my blessed, and depart from me, you cursed. And the fundamental problem remains idolatry, doesn't it? Little children, says one John, keep yourself from idols. Still a problem for us. Or here's Paul in Colossians. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your sinful nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, as in the days of Jeremiah, the wrath of God is coming. Friends, Jeremiah warned of judgment because of idolatry. And despite the mockery, he persisted until judgment came. The death and resurrection of Jesus changed the game. There is now forgiveness bought for us and clear. We are given, as Jeremiah had promised, a hope and a future. But the New Testament warns us, us, that God's wrath is still coming. And as people addressed by Jeremiah, he calls us to examine our own hearts and then speak with fear and with promise. Let's be quiet for a moment and then we'll pray. Little children, keep yourselves from idols. Heavenly Father, Jeremiah's concern here, it's transformed by the death and resurrection of Jesus. But there's a continuity, a deep continuity, about the way of blessing and the way of destruction. We pray that you'll give us the humility to look at our own hearts, our own minds, to see where we too allow ourselves to worship idols. Maybe not statues, but statues of greed. We pray that you will give us the grace that we can turn to the Lord Jesus Christ for forgiveness. Pray that we will turn to him, receive mercy. Pray that we will live obediently and joyfully. Thank you that ultimately the, the clearest eyed sight of what a terrible thing judgment is has been absorbed by the Lord Jesus on our behalf. But we pray nonetheless that you will give us the ability to understand what grieves the Spirit. Pray that you will give us grace to live by your power for your glory. And Father, as we look out on a world which echoes this picture, we pray that you will give us the grace and mercy to hold out the word of life to those who otherwise face your destruction. Amen. Thanks, Chris, indeed, for bringing us God's Word uh, from Jeremiah 11. Friends, we have covered much today, day two. I believe all of us have been encouraged yep, to preach God's Word, all of God's Word, especially the Old Testament, in the light of the whole. But we are also reminded that we should not be simplistic in the way we do that, to make it monotonous. Yeah, to reduce God's manifold wisdom in a way um, with only a simplistic model, yeah, but rather to work hard at presenting 
God's truth in all its glory. May we take to heart what has been shown to us, what has been modeled for us today. And may we continue to encourage one another and above all, rely on the Spirit of God, our teacher, as we continue to work together and encourage one another. 